Book Four, Canto Six, The Legend of Campbell and Telamond. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. Book Four, The Legend of Campbell and Telamond. Canto Six. Both Scudamore and Arthegall do fight with Britomart. He sees her face, doth fall in love, and soon from her depart. What equal torment to the grief of mind, and pining anguish hid in gentle heart, that inly feeds itself with thoughts unkind, and nourisheth her own consuming smart? What medicine can any leech's art yield such a sore that doth her grievance hide and will to none her malady impart such was the wound that scudamore did gride for which dan phoebus self cannot a salve provide who having left that restless house of care the next day as he on his way did ride full of melancholy and sad misfare through misconceit all unawares espied an armed knight under a forest side, sitting in shade beside his grazing steed, who soon as them approaching he descried, gan towards them to prick with eager speed, that seemed he was full bent to some mischievous deed, which Scudamore perceiving forth issued to have rencountered him in equal race, but soon as the other nigh approaching viewed the arms he bore, his spear he gan abase, and void his course, at which so sudden case he wondered much. But the other thus can say, Ah, gentle Scudamore, under your grace, I me submit, and you of pardon pray, that almost had against you trespassed this day. Whereto thus a Scudamore, Small harm it were for any knight upon a venturous knight without displeasance, for to prove his spear. But read you, sir, sith ye my name have height, what is your own that I mote you requite? Certes, said he, ye mote is now excuse me from discovering you my name aright, for time yet serves that I the same refuse. But call ye me the salvage knight as others use. This then, Sir Salvage Knight, quoth he, a reed, or do you hear within this forest one, that seemeth well to answer to your weed, or have ye it for some occasion done, that rather seems, sith no in arms ye shun? This other day, said he, a stranger knight, shame and dishonour, hath unto me done, on whom I wait to wreak that foul despite, whenever he this way shall pass, by day or night. Shame be his meed, quoth he, that meaneth shame, for what is he by whom ye shame it were? A stranger knight, said he, unknown by name, but known by fame, and by an ebon spear, with which he all that met him down did bear. He in an open tourney lately held from me the honour of that game did rear and having me all weary erst, down felled, the fairest lady reft, and ever since withheld. When Scudamore heard mention of that spear, he wist right well that it was Britomart, the which from him his fairest love did bear, though gan he swell in every inner part, for fell despite and gnaw his jealous heart, that it thus he sharply said, now by my head yet is not this the first unknightly part which that same knight whom by his lance i read hath done to noble knights that many makes him dread for lately he my love hath throw me reft and eke defiled with foul villainy the sacred pledge which in his faith was left in shame of knighthood and fidelity the which ere long full dear he shall abide and if to that avenge by you decreed this hand may help, or succour aught supply, it shall not fail when so ye shall it need. 
so both to wreak their wraths on Britomart agreed. Whiles thus they communed, lo, far away, a knight soft riding towards them they spied, attired in foreign arms in strange array, whom when they nigh approached they plain descried to be the same for whom they did abide. Said then Sir Scudamore, Sir Salvage Knight, let me this crave, sith first I was defied, that first I may that wrong to him requite, and if I hap to fail, you shall recure my right. Which, being yielded, he his threatful spear gan feud her, and against her fiercely ran, who soon as she him saw approaching near, with so fell rage herself she lightly gan to dight, to welcome him well as she can, but entertained him in so rude a wise, that to the ground she smote both horse and man, whence neither greatly hasted to arise, but on their common harms together did devise. But Artegall, beholding his mischance, new matter added to his former fire, and eft aventuring his steel-headed lance, against her road full of dispiteous ire that naught but spoil and vengeance did require but to himself his felonious intent returning disappointed his desire whiles unawares his saddle he forewent and found himself on ground in great amazement lightly he started up out of that stound and snatching forth his direful deadly blade did leap to her as doth an eager hound thrust to an hind within some covert glade whom without peril he cannot invade with such fell greediness he her assailed that though she mounted were yet he her made to give him ground so much his force prevailed and shun his mighty strokes gainst which no arms availed so as they coursed here and there, it chanced that in her wheeling round, behind her crest so sorely he her strook, that since it glanced adown her back, the which it fairly blessed, from foul mischance, nay did it ever rest, till on her horse's hinder parts it fell, where biting deep so deadly it impressed, that quite it kind his back behind the cell, and to alight on foot her algates did compel, like as the lightning brand from riven sky, thrown out by angry Jove in his vengeance, with dreadful force falls on some steeple high, which, battering down it on the church, doth glance, and tears it all with terrible mischance. Yet she no whit dismayed her steed forsook, and casting from her that enchanted lance, unto her sword and shield her soon betook, and therewithal at him right furiously she struck. So furiously she struck in her first heat, whilst with long fight on foot he breathless was, that she him forced backward to retreat, and yield unto her weapon way to pass, whose raging rigour neither steel nor brass could stay, but to the tender flesh it went, and poured the purple blood forth on the grass, that all his mail arrived, and plates errent shewed all his body bare unto the cruel dent. At length, when as he saw her hasty heat abate, and panting breath begin to fail, he, through long sufferance growing now more great, rose in his strength and gan her fresh assail, heaping huge strokes as thick as shower of hail, and lashing dreadfully at every part, as if he thought her soul to disentrail. Ah, cruel hand, and thrice more cruel heart, that work'st such wreck on her to whom thou dearest art! What iron courage ever could endure to work such outrage on so fair a creature? and in his madness think with hands impure to spoil so goodly workmanship of nature, the maker's self resembling in her feature. Certes, some hellish fury, or some fiend, this mischief 
framed for their first love's defeature to bathe their hands in blood of dearest friend thereby to make their love's beginning their lives end thus long they traced and traversed to and fro sometimes pursuing and sometimes pursued still as advantage they espied thereto but toward the end sir arthurgall renewed his strength still more but she still more decreed at last his luckless hand he heaved on high having his forces all in one accrued and therewith stroke at her so hideously that seemed naught but death mote be her destiny the wicked stroke upon her helmet chanced and with the force which in itself it bore her ventail shard away and thenceforth glanced adown in vain ne harmed her any more with that her angel's face unseen afore like to the ruddy morn appeared in sight dewed with silver drops through sweating sore but somewhat redder than beseemed aright through toilsome heat and labour of her weary fight and round about the same her yellow hair having through stirring loosed their wonted band like to a golden border did appear framed in goldsmith's forge with cunning hand yet goldsmith's cunning could not understand to frame such subtle wire so shiny clear for it did glister like the golden sand the which pactolus with his waters sheer throws forth upon the rivage round about him near and as his hand he up again did rear thinking to work on her his utmost rack his powerless arm benumbed with secret fear from his revengeful purpose shrunk aback and cruel sword out of his fingers slack fell down to ground as if the steel had sense and felt some ruth or sense his hand did lack or both of them did think obedience to do to so divine a beauty's excellence and he himself long gazing thereupon at last fell humbly down upon his knee and of his wonder made religion weening some heavenly goddess he did see or else unwitting what it else might be and pardon her besought his error frail that had done outrage in so high degree whilst trembling horror did his sense assail and made each member quake and manly heart to quail natheless she full of wrath for that late stroke all that long while upheld her wrathful hand with fell intent on him to be eroke and looking stern still over him did stand threatening to strike unless he would withstand and bade him rise or surely he should die but die or live for naught he would upstand but her of pardon prayed more earnestly or wreak on him her will for so great injury which when as scudamore who now abraid beheld whereas he stood not far aside he was therewith right wondrously dismayed and drawing nigh when as he plain descried that peerless pattern of dame nature's pride and heavenly image of perfection he blessed himself as one sore terrified and turning his fear to faint devotion did worship her as some celestial vision but glaucy seeing all that chanced there well weeting how their error to a soil full glad of so good end to them drew near and her salute with seemly bellacoil joyous to see her safe after long toil then her besought as she to her was dear to grant unto those warriors truce a while which yielded they their beavers up did rear and shewed themselves to her as such as indeed they were when britomart with sharp aviseful eye beheld the lovely face of artigal tempered with sternness and stout majesty she gan eftsoons it to her mind to call to be the same which in her father's hall long since in that enchanted glass she saw therewith her wrathful courage gan appall and haughty spirits meekly to adore 
that her in haunted hand she down gan soft withdraw yet she it forced to have again upheld as feigning choler which was turned to cold but ever when his visage she beheld her hand fell down and would no longer hold the wrathful weapon gainst his countenance bold but when in vain to fight she oft essayed she armed her tongue and thought it him to scold nay the less her tongue not to her will obeyed but brought forth speeches mild when she would have missaid but scudamore now walks an inly glad that all his jealous fear he false had found and how that hag his love abused had with breach of faith and loyalty unsound the which long time his grieved heart did wound he thus bespake certes sir artigal i joy to see you lout so low on ground and now become to live a lady's thrall that while ome in your mind want to despise them all soon as she heard the name of artigal her heart did leap and all her heart strings tremble for sudden joy and secret fear withal and all her vital powers with motion nimble to succour it themselves gan there assemble that by the swift recourse of flushing blood right plain appeared though she it would dissemble and feigned still her former angry mood thinking to hide the depth by troubling of the flood when glauce thus gan wisely all up knit ye gentle knights whom fortune here hath brought to be spectators of this uncouth fit which secret fate hath in this lady wrought against the course of kind ne marvel not ne thenceforth fear the thing that hitherto hath troubled both your minds with idle thought fearing least she your loves away should woo fear it in vain sith means ye see there wants there too and you sir artigal the salvage knight henceforth may not disdain that woman's hand hath conquered you and you in second fight for while ome they have conquered sea and land and heaven itself that naught may them withstand nay henceforth be rebellious unto love that is the crown of knighthood and the band of noble minds derived from above which being knit with virtue never will remove and you fair lady knight my dearest dame relent the rigour of your wrathful will whose fire were better turned to other flame and wiping out remembrance of all ill grant him your grace but so that he fulfil the penance which ye shall to him impart for lovers heaven must pass by sorrow's hell there at full inly blushed britomart with artigal close smiling joyed in secret heart yet durst he not make love so suddenly nay think the affection of her heart to draw from one to other so quite contrary besides her modest countenance he saw so goodly grave and full of princely awe that it his ranging fancy did refrain and looser thoughts to lawful bounds withdraw whereby the passion grew more fierce and fain like to a stubborn steed whom strong hand would restrain but scudamore whose heart twixt doubtful fear and feeble hope hung all this while suspense desiring of his amoret to hear some gladful news and sure intelligence her thus bespake but sir without offence mote i request you tidings of my love my amoret sith you her freed fro thence where she captived long great woes did prove that where ye left I may her seek, as doth behove. To whom thus Britomart, certes, Sir Knight, what is of her become, or whether reft, I cannot unto you a read aright, for from that time I from enchanter's theft her freed, in which ye her all hopeless left, I her preserved from peril and from fear, and evermore from villainy her kept, Nay ever was there white to me more dear, 
than she, nay, unto whom I more true love did bear. Till on a day, as through a desert wild, we travelled, both weary of the way, we did alight, in setting shadow mild, where fearless I to sleep me down did lay. But when as I did out of sleep a bray, I found her not where I her left while ear, but thought she wandered was, or gone astray. I called her loud, I sought her far and near, but nowhere could her find, nor tidings of her here. When Scudamore those heavy tidings heard, his heart was thrilled with point of deadly fear, nay in his face or blood or life appeared, but senseless stood, like to a mazed steer, that yet of mortal stroke the stound doth bear. Till Glaucy thus, Fair sir, be not dismayed with needless dread, Till certainty ye hear, For yet she may be safe, though somewhat strayed. It's best to hope the best, though of the worst afraid. Natheless he hardly of her cheerful speech did comfort take, Or in his troubled sight should change of better cheer. So sore a breach that sudden news had made in his sprite, Till Britomart him fairly thus behight. Great cause of sorrow, certes, sir, ye have, but comfort take, For by this heaven's light I vow, you dead or living, not to leave Till I her find, and wreak on him that her did reave. Therewith he rested, and well pleased was, so peace being confirmed amongst them all, they took their steeds, and forward thence did pass, unto some resting place which mote befall, all being guided by Sir Artigal, where goodly solace was unto them made, and daily feasting both in bower and hall, until that they their wounds well healed had, and weary limbs recured after late usage bad. In all which time Sir Artigal made way unto the love of noble Britomart, and with meek service and much suit did lay continual siege unto her gentle heart, which being whilome launched with lovely dart, more eath was new impression to receive. However she her pained with womanish art to hide her wound, that none might it perceive. Vain is the art that seeks itself for to deceive. So well he wooed her, and so well he wrought her, With fair entreaty and sweet blandishment, That at length unto a bay he brought her, So as she to his speeches was content, To lend an ear and softly to relent. At last through many vows which forth he poured, And many oaths, she yielded her consent to be his love, and take him for her lord, till they with marriage meet might finish that accord. Though when they had long time there taken rest, Sir Artigal, who all this while was bound upon a hard adventure yet in quest, fit time for him thence to depart it found, to follow that which he did long propound, and unto her his congee came to take, but her therewith full sore displeased he found, And loath to leave her late betrothed make, Her dearest love full loath so shortly to forsake. Yet he with strong persuasions her assuaged, And won her will to suffer him depart, For which his faith with her he fast engaged, And thousand vows from bottom of his heart, That all so soon as he by wit or art Could that achieve, Whereto he did aspire, he unto her would speedily revert, No longer space thereto he did desire, But till the horned moon three courses did expire, With which she for the present was appeased, And yielded leave, however malcontent she inly were, And in her mind displeased. So early in the morrow, next he went forth on his way, to which he was y bent, ne white him to attend, or way to guide, as whilom was the custom ancient, 
mongst knights, when on adventures they did ride, save that she all gates him a while accompanied. And by the way she sundry purpose found, of this or that the time for to delay, and of the perils whereto he was bound, the fear whereof seemed much her to affray. But all she did was but to wear out day. Full oftentimes she leave of him did take, and eft again devised some what to say, which she forgot, whereby excuse to make. So loath she was his company, for to forsake. At last, when all her speeches she had spent, and new occasion failed her more to find, she left him to his fortune's government, and back returned with right heavy mind, to Scudamore, whom she had left behind, with whom she went to seek fair Amoret, her second care, though in another kind. For virtue's only sake, which doth beget true love and faithful friendship, she by her did set. Back to that desert forest they retired, where sorry Britomart had lost her late. There they her sought, and everywhere inquired, where they might tidings get of her estate. Yet found they none, but by what hapless fate or hard misfortune she was thence conveyed, and stone away from her beloved mate, were long to tell. Therefore I here will stay until another tide, that I it finish may. End of Canto 6, Book 4, The Legend of Campbell and Telemond.